think that's on. Is it on? Got it. Good. Uh, good to be with you again this morning. I, I missed one announcement, um, a couple. Yeah, it's Children's Church is going on right now, so I think Julie will lead them back. So, excellent. You guys have a great time. Might be, a, strangely enough, might be a little warmer down there. I, it's kind of cold in here. I'll, I'll try to do my best to get something figured out on that, getting the boiler going again, that big old crazy thing in the basement going uh, this week. We'll see what we can do. But uh, anyway, uh, one announcement I did uh, miss that I wanted to let you know, uh, we, are, we do have a, a need in the sound booth. Um, so if there's anybody interested um, in taking one of the shifts of the sound booth, uh, kind of techie kind of thing, if you're interested at all in that, feel free to talk to Don. I think he's back there, um, back sitting uh, back there at the couch kind of area. Feel free to check with him. And that didn't make it in the bullets, and I'll try to do that in the future weeks, but I want to let you know that. So, All right, we're going to start in a new book, a new study. We finished Philippians, had a great time in Philippians. I think we're going to have, I believe, an even better time in a book called Nehemiah in the Old Testament. So I'll let you go ahead and turn there. We're going to be in chapter 1. I'll give you plenty of uh, time to look for that real quick. And I want to ask you a question as we start. Um, Have you ever missed a sign? Um, Have you just, you know, I I look at some of these things and, you know... uh, Keep off the ice. I, I could imagine, you know, maybe the person in the car thought that was just people and not his car. But, uh, you know, um, anyway, and you've seen some of these. I like the polar bear missing the ice thing. So they should know. Um, I like that bottom one even the best. Do the price increase of ammo. Do not expect a warning shot. I, that's one you don't want to miss. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, I've missed a sign in my day and have paid various uh, penalties for that. One I can remember that fortunately I somehow got out of in in Augusta where we live. There's a a dental uh, uh, clinic alongside of a vision uh, clinic, and uh, they're really close to each other. And their signs always mix me up. There's a sign in front of the dental clinic that's really for the vision clinic, and so I I, so but and I, I knew that even going in. But I went to the to go to get my eyes checked. And probably for this very reason, but but I went in and there was this nice little gated courtyard area where I thought the dental clinic was, and so I walked into this gated, nice, little, like looking like a welcome area. In fact, I think it said "welcome" in wrought iron over the you know thing. So I, I walk in and I, and I walk in this door, which ended up being the back door, and and I ignored the sign that said "employees only," you know. Okay, and, and that's that's there for your, you know, better, you know, good. It's not like they're hiding anything from you. You need to heed those warnings. Because I went, I went in and I walked in, and it's around noon time, so things are kind of, you know, there's not a lot of people. You know, so I was just like, okay, well, maybe I'll find the, you know, the the welcome area or whatever, the the the, uh, the waiting area. So I I started walking through this hallway and turning a whole bunch of corners, and I was getting lost. And you know, and I'm in a dental office. You know, I mean, there's fewer things worse than going to the dentist, let alone. Being being lost in the dentist office, how horrible this is, you can imagine. And and so I'm getting, you know, I'm like, where in the world? And now, because I'm learning, you know, like, these are not like eye chairs and those picks that don't, you know, pick at your eyes. You know, this is a dental office. So I get so lost. I end up, strangely enough, in their waiting area, but I don't just end up in their waiting area. I end up, like, walking through this door, behind, and I'm in their the reception area. And, and and I'm looking, and there's people that are like workers, and their scrubs starting to walk through, and I like duck, you know. I'm like, and and, I, and then I look, and then right on the desk, there's a whole bunch of money laying there, like they were counting something up. I'm like, oh, this is a great story. And yeah, I'm looking, you know, I'm seeing around. There's cameras, and I'm like, no, oh, this is going to be great. Somebody's got to get this tape, you know. And then so I'm like trying to figure out how to James Bond it out, you know. How do I get out of here without being seen? Amazingly, I made it out. But that was like 20 minutes, and I was late for my other appointment. I had a great story for Julie later on, but it was just a mess. Um, missing a sign, and uh, you know, I'm sure you have, and to varying degrees, like you, like I said, of punishment whenever you miss a sign. Um, but I would challenge you today, as we get into Nehemiah uh, today specifically, but even throughout this whole book, there's going to be some signs that the Spirit is giving us. The Old Testament was used, even though sometimes people, I don't know, the Old Testament's not for me. It doesn't speak to me. It, no, I think this will. I really think this book will speak to you and to me. And I believe the Spirit's using these books in the Old Testament to wake us up and even give us signs, uh, literally, to, to cause us to think and wonder and ponder what God's trying to do or what He's trying to say to us. And so when we look at Nehemiah, I want to give you a little bit of background before we get in. 
Uh, you can look in your notes, and there's some things you're going to be able to fill out. Um, but this book of Nehemiah is a very interesting one written in between 445 and 420 B.C. By Nehemiah, there's a lot of authors that will say, well, it was written by Ezra. And really, this is the second book of Ezra. If you go back to the Septuagint of the Latin Vulgate, um, you would see that it might be written as called the second book of Ezra, that it might have been kind of a sequel to the book of Ezra. Um, yeah, could be. You know, as, or Nehemiah seems to be mentioning himself in it some, but then it could have been written back. You know, so I mean, there's a lot of speculation there, but it's either written by Nehemiah or Ezra. Um, for our purposes today, we're going to say that it's written by Nehemiah, and I think we'd be safe saying that even. It's one of three post-exilic books. Uh, including Ezra and Esther. Now, this is after the 70-year Babylonian captivity, okay? This is when they, they went, right? Remember, in Babylonian captivity, the Lord was promising them because of how they were living. He, he said that, I'm going to have to lead you into this, right? And, uh, and we see that, and if you read Ezra... You would see some inter- in- interesting things in, in your notes. You can look at this. If you read, these three books really get put together super well. Because as Israel is being led out of captivity back into their land, you see Ezra, the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther all being written during that time that they're getting back into their land. And you see them during that time, uh, uh, different things taking place. And, and Ezra... You'll see that Ezra, and this is important, the name meanings. You're gonna, if you hang around me very often or very long, you're gonna realize that names have huge implications to your life, or names have huge meanings to what's going on in your life and the lives uh, of people around you. Ezra means, in Hebrew, helper. It's gonna play an important role here in just a second. That accounts the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. If you go back, and this is Zerubbabel was one of the first uh, um, uh, guys that brought the Jews uh, kind of out of captivity. Uh, there's like three different uh, waves of people being brought out of captivity back into the lands. Zerubbabel was the one first that started during this time. Ezra is the one accounting during that time of the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. King Cyrus, you might have heard before, the Persian king during that time, allowed the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And this was an amazing thing after the Jews had been pretty much, you know, uh, diminished as a people. Um, And and yet Cyrus allows them to go back into the land that they, they, you know, was theirs at one time, still is theirs because God's in control of it. And gives them a rebuilding of the temple. The Allah even pays for it. I mean, how amazing this is. And so Ezra, the book of Ezra, really accounts that time. And it means helper. Now, who is our helper in the New Testament, folks? The Holy Spirit. John 14. You'll see that. He's called the helper. And if you look at this and take a step back with eyes that look through, kind of, kind of with the, the glance at the New Testament, the understanding that we have, we see a picture of salvation and justification by the Spirit. You can check those out. Remember, we are the what? The temple of the Holy Spirit, right? We know that from 1 Corinthians 6.19. And so when we see the the Holy Spirit really using the book of Ezra, showing that it's time to rebuild the temple for the people, it should cause for you and I to realize that there is a point in time in the the justification, sanctification, glorification, that work of of God. We see that at the very beginning, when we accept Him into our lives, we, we have this temple that's filled with the Spirit of God. And we see that that's the very beginning, the helping of the rebuilding of our lives, because we knew without God we're just a mess. We are, aren't we? And so we see that, the helper, the Holy Spirit being woven into the Old Testament even during this time, of Israel being led out of the, the brokenness that they, they felt. And so I think you're going to see this as we talk about some of these things. You're going to see this, the, the lives that God wants to put back together by His Spirit. The, the lives of not just his people, but you and me today. And so we see the book of Ezra was that way. But Nehemiah that we start talking about today in this book uh, that we're going to start today, he, it means comforter. Now, who's our comforter? 
The Holy Spirit, John 14, calls him the Comforter. Jesus promised that he would send another Comforter, meaning one exactly like him, and he would indwell us, and he would lead us and guide us in truth, and, and he would help us to remember the things that Jesus taught us, and what a wonderful work of the Spirit. But this, the book of Nehemiah, what we're going to see over the next 13 or so chapters is the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the city itself. Now, this is going to be the reestablishment of government. This is going to be the defenses built back for the city of Jerusalem. And when we talk about spiritual matters of our body that are like that, we generally need to understand the, the division. And we, it's talked about in Corinthians, and we'll probably hit it here sometime in, in the next week or so. Understanding the body, the soul, and the spirit. And when we talk about the, 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 the book of Nehemiah and we talk about really trying to correlate that with my life today and understanding that, we need a better understanding of the soul. The soul is our what, folks? Somebody, somebody might know. Our mind, our will, and our emotions, as it's been said very well. The soul that was talked about in Scripture it is the, kind of the feeler of who we are. Um, it's important that we understand, too, that really our soul is something that is saved, yes, and is sanctified, yes. The Spirit, though, is sealed. The Spirit's sealed from the day of redemption. The Spirit's the only thing good about you and I. <laughs> the sad thing is the soul can be easily manipulated by the evil one. Our, our emotions, our, our minds can be easily impacted by the, the darts, of the, the fiery darts of the devil. The thoughts that come, the temptations that come. Our, it's easy for the soul to, I guess, be not defended, not governed. And I think that you're going to see in Nehemiah that the biggest problem, especially in this first chapter, was a people that did not have a defense. They did not have, they, they, they had the temple, sure. They, they had the plan of God in place. They saw that they were coming back out of, out of, out of uh, captivity like God had promised. And that's so great. But they were still getting fought you know, with and, and fired upon. And things were not good, you're going to see in this first chapter. And how important we realize that as it relates to our soul, that this book is going to be the rebuilding of our soul. What does it take to get a strong soul so that our emotions aren't moved by the things of life, that, 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 our, that our defenses aren't knocked down whenever things come, whenever temptations rise that are trying for your demise or mine? It's an important study in rebuilding the soul, and that's what we're going to take quite a few weeks to do as we look through this book. I think it's also interesting that if you check out Esther, which is the next book that's in this trilogy, literally in the Old Testament, uh, Esther was written during the time of Ezra, but it's placed in there as a reminder that during that time of Ezra's writings, well, during that time of Ezra being uh, working in the midst of his book and the writing that happened, uh, she had this work of preserving, if you remember, preserving the Jewish people. Now, her name means hidden. And what's interesting about Ezra, or Esther, the book of Esther, does anybody... No one thing that's really strangely interesting about it's the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention who God. Interesting. Yet in the midst of the work that God did, he doesn't take any credit. Isn't that interesting? His work is hidden in that book. By His Spirit, we know that we don't see the Spirit at work. We don't always, under, well, we, we can, we do. We even give Him glory for it. But a lot of times the world even around us, and, and, and we don't give Him necessarily the credit where credit's due, and He's fine to be hidden. The work of the Spirit seems very hidden sometimes to us. But I think it's important to note, again, Esther's the accounting, the preserving of the Jewish people, the Jewish body, and the Holy Spirit's preserving work in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 is clear. Ephesians 1, he's the seal for us for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is preserving your body and mine, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, for that, that rapturous day. And he's faithful and he's able to, to, to keep that which is committed unto him. It's a great thing. That the Spirit does. And yet it's hidden. We don't quite maybe understand it all or see it all taking place. 
There will be a day we will understand it. We'll totally see it. So this trilogy is a really important rebuilding of the spirit, the soul, and the body. So I challenge you to read these other books. We're really going to mainly stay in, in, uh, in Nehemiah for, like I say, the next few weeks as we talk about rebuilding our soul. What does that look like personally? What does that look like as a church? How does God want to rebuild us? I think it's going to be a neat study, and I'm excited. So let's get into it. I wanted to give you some background. Um, there, I mean, there's so much more I could give you. This is the last historical book Nehemiah is uh, of the Old Testament. It's the last chronological, not chronological itself, but uh, chronology of the things that happen in the Old Testament. Um, you know, he's the second. Nehemiah is the second. Goodness, why do I even say this? I'm just going to say it. He's the he's the he's the second shortest character in the Bible. You've heard it, right? Who's the shortest, right? Because he's Nehemiah, right? You've heard it. Sunday school. Who's the, somebody know the first, the, the shortest person in the Bible? Bill Dad the Shuhai. Thank you. Okay. He, sorry. When you when you trudge through Old Testament books like you know Numbers and all that stuff, you just you know your mind just. Things become funny when he's, what in the world? No, anyway, this is going to be a great study. So let's look at it. Let's go into verse 1. We're going to be in chapter 1. So look at the first three verses of Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hashaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year that I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from, Jude, uh, from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from, their, from the captivity in the providence are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. You hear this, this report given in the king's palace and presence. And Nehemiah is this cupbearer we're going to see. He's this guy that's a, a fairly high-ranking person right now. That God has given him the ability, again, for just this amazing time as Esther was. To be able to rebuild the people, the Jews. And he really has a heart for his people and seeing his country built back. And he wanted a report and he got this report from these men and it wasn't good. Some of your versions translate this differently, but I want to challenge you to look at three things. In rebuilding, first, we, rebuilding the soul, we must start by truthfully assessing the situation. Today we're going to talk about three things that start and help us start rebuilding the soul. And the first thing is we must assess, or the assessment. You know, Nehemiah had to know things weren't necessarily good. It might have excited him that the temple was being rebuilt, but he had to know that over 70 years, things just decay. I heard the grand old, uh, not the grand old Opry, but the, the grand um, that in Branson, that main, um, oh goodness, I can't even think of what it's called now. On the main strip, there's a big old white building. I think they used to have like the... the, the uh, uh, Miss America pads in it, and they had, had a bunch of different entertainers. Anyway, it was one of the main buildings on the Strip. Um, big old, like, White House-looking kind of thing. I can't remember exactly what it's called. But they had just, it had just gotten uh, bought this last week after being six years closed up uh, out of foreclosure, and they're going to do something new with it in Branson. It's kind of interesting. But they were saying they were worried about opening the doors because they didn't know what would happen in six years. I mean, because it's amazing what can happen in six years in a, in a place that's all closed up. And I think 70 years in a town and a place that just got totally annihilated, destroyed. Well, people got led away. You would imagine that Nehemiah is thinking, I don't know if I really, I have a heart for my people, but there's just no hope. There's just no way that this can be rebuilt. That this could really, really, there's no way the royals could win the pennant. <laughs> but he had to take a moment out of the reality that seemed to be so harsh, and he had to make an assessment and an honest one at that. He had to own up to what was really taking place. He had to get the information to understand what was right. And he got the information. You know, and see, whenever we deal with our soul, sometimes taking a moment is really hard to stop and assess where we're at with the Lord and how our defenses are looking or how our city is being built. Because sometimes we just don't want to know how bad it is. We don't want to think about how... You know, things might not be super good in my life with the Lord right now. 
But he had to take a moment in a time here. In knowing the situation could be dire and and rough, he couldn't avoid it. He had to deal with it. And so should we in our own lives. So should we as a church. And this is the report he got back. And I believe here's why we need to assess the damage. Because all hope's not lost, folks. In the battle over the soul, some escape. He said, he said that somebody, somebody escaped here. In verse 3, it's, they, they let him know that some, or, uh, yeah, but verse 3, let me look at the right side of the page here. It, it mentioned that some, actually in verse 2, some of the Jews had escaped. And, you know, in the battle over your soul and my soul, we know in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 13, that we have the ability to escape. No temptation has seized you but what is common to man. But the Lord is faithful. He will always provide a means of escape. In the battle over our soul, the Lord is so good by His Spirit to always provide an escape opportunity when you and I and our soul is really, you know, in jeopardy. We got an, uh, an opportunity to escape the temptations that come our way. And that's important that we see that some escape. Now, some do suffer. Some get stuck in the city and they get stuck with the, the walls down. They get stuck with the fire of the enemy. And they just keep getting a beating. You and I have seen that. And, but First John 2 has this great promise. And in, in, in chapter 2 of First John, it says that even when we do sin, he writes just before that, well, I, I write to you something that you may not sin, but even when we do sin, we have an advocate, which is Jesus Christ, the righteous. You and I have an advocate. Uh, a beautiful, wonderful picture, understanding here, even from the Old Testament, that even when we struggle, there's still hope. And there's one on the throne that died for our sins that we can, we can connect with, we can confess to, and He is faithful. He's righteous. He's willing to forgive even when we do sin. And we do make mistakes. No matter what situation you face, if you're struggling today, the good thing is there's still a heartbeat left. There's still a plan that God has for you. There's still a chance that you can turn around and things can be rebuilt. What a wonderful promise, but the the bummer, the big, the big bummer is that there are some that aren't so lucky and some die. Look at these verses. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. These verses have troubled many. In fact, we're going to talk about a few verses that have troubled many people in the church. And I've heard a lot of questions lately on some like Bible man answer kind of uh, um, shows. Because you know that these verses kind of trouble some people. And they should. They should cause us to wonder what happens when the soul just gets kind of left with no defense and just constantly barraged. Well, in 1 Corinthians 5, there was a man that was having relations with his stepmom. I mean, it was just a mess. You know the situation, or some of you might, in 1 Corinthians 5. And Paul, he, he, the Spirit empire, inspired Paul to say this. He said, deliver this man, or such uh, a one, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, I, honestly, strangely enough, I find some comfort in this. I don't know about you. <laughs> In that, okay, even when this guy is just is so deep in sin, unrepentant, not interested in turning, that, that Paul has even given him even a little bit of hope <laughs> that he might be saved someday. But his flesh is going to be destroyed. That's what Paul's saying. He's trying to let this guy know, man, in reading this to the Corinthian church, and maybe when the Corinthian church gets this, they'll read it to him. And in fact, they did, because 2 Corinthians, we, we find this guy was cut to the heart, man. He heard this. He, he understood the reality that if you get stuck in sin and you don't build up the defenses, you don't reclaim the walls, you don't let the governance of the, of, of, of the city, your, your temple, take over and the governance of the Holy Spirit take over, and you just go your merry way, there's a very real chance that your soul can be destroyed. Not that will soul destroyed, sorry, not annihilation, your, your, your body will say that. Look at it in 1 John 5, it puts it this way. If anyone sees a brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask or pray, and he will give him life to those who commit sin not leading to death. It's great. There's a promise there that's in in 1 John 5. If you're praying for somebody to sins not leading to death, 
God is great and happy to intervene. But, but get this, there is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All sin is, unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin that's not leading to death. Well, that brings up a lot of questions. There's sin that leads to death? What's that? I, uh, what I get from this is I see that there are sins that, that John's saying, you know what, you, you, and this, this is tough, guys. Hear this out, though. There's some things not worth praying over because there are some sins that people get into that lead to death, and there's just no turning back. I'm not saying that God couldn't heal somebody with HIV. He could. He can miraculously do anything. But that's a sin that leads to death. And, and we could pray all day, God, take this away, miraculously heal him. But it's a very real possibility and probably the possibility that God, in his sovereign grace and goodness, not that this person can't be saved or that person stuck in this kind of sin or that that's leading to death couldn't be saved. No, they probably can be. But that doesn't mean that their body is going to be necessarily saved in this lifetime. The, the, the sequence and the, the, the repercussions of sin will catch up. Is this sobering? I haven't even read out of 1 Corinthians 11. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. That there were people that were uh, it, it, taking the, 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 the table, taking communion in, in an unworthy manner. And Paul makes a really, slips in a really interesting thing. And he says, because some people have been taking it in an unworthy manner, some have fallen asleep. And that's not that they had fallen asleep in church because the preacher went long. No, that's, they croaked. And don't think that this is just a physical thing that can take you. I, Ananias and Sapphira in, in, in Acts. Man, their lives were taken like that because they withheld what they knew in their hearts that God had told them to give. And actually it says that they had promised God that they would give. Will we see Ananias and Sapphira in heaven? Probably. I think we could. I think that it's just like like First Corinthians five. That their, their soul was destroyed, or not soul, rather, rather body was destroyed. Their flesh was turned over to Satan, so that they could be saved in the day. They just they were committed. They had this life, this 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 hard heart that God saw that if they continue with this hard heart, they're going to blaspheme the name of the Lord. They're going to make a mockery of the just as it was read in the situation of David. We're, we're, I'm going to take, uh, this is hard, and this, this doesn't always make sense, but I'm going to take David, your son. I'm going to take this kid. Because if he continued, this would have just made a mockery of, of your God. It's hard. It's hard reality, but it's, it needs to be. Do you see how important it is to deal with sin, folks? Left unchecked, it, not only wrecks an, it can not only wreck also an eternity, especially for other people thinking that it's just okay. To live like that and follow those things. No, but it can actually take your own life. It's important that we listen up today because this message could save your very life. So it's important that we don't ignore the, the warning signs. We don't just say, you know, God, whatever. It's just sin. You always forgive it. Whoa. God wants to check the heart today of each one of us. And make sure, again, not for our demise or not so that we don't have fun in life and all. He wants us to understand that there are sins that just take us down that road. And He doesn't want us to go there. So we've got to first assess the situation in our own lives. What are we doing? Where, how, how are we doing? What's, what's going on? Are my defenses up or are they down? Has this been, uh, you know, all about, you know, me and my life, or is this really am I living for the Lord? It's a sobering thing that they find. Let's go back to Nehemiah 1, and let's continue and see verses 4 through 7. We see a, a, another thing that happens here. So it was in verse 4, When I heard these words, that I sat down and I wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I, I pray, Lord, God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I prayed before you now, day and night, 
for the uh, children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of, of uh, Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, verse 7, and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. I think the, first, the second thing, the first thing we need to do is assess where we're at. The second thing we need to do is simply confess. In rebuilding the soul, we must stop and connect to the Spirit. Right? Psalm 139, 23 through 24. I think it says in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might sin against you. And Psalm 139 says, Search me and know me, O God. Try my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me so that I can be led into the way of everlasting life. Right? It's important that we stop and we say, Search me, search me, Lord. Know me. So, so, that, so that I have this heart of confessing. And, and I like, though, the important thing that we got to remember. Again, this is about the work of the Spirit. This book is going to be about how the Spirit engages the soul and, and works in rebuilding the soul. In Romans 8.27, we said last week and even the week before, and I want to remind you of this promise today, that when we don't even know what to pray, when we're like David, is like, search me, know me. I don't know what's wrong with me. I just don't, things aren't right. I know that. Search me and know me, God. Understand this, as we have that promise, Romans 8, that says, even when we don't know what to pray, we have the Holy Spirit in us that expresses groanings that cannot even be uttered. One that is so, I mean, the Spirit has so much emotion. In fact, we can grieve the Spirit, as it says in Ephesians. So it's important that we, we connect with the Spirit. He searches us. He knows us. He knows what to pray. He knows what the, the, the deal is with you and me. And I think it is important that we just not only connect with the Spirit, but we do. We, we mourn. James 4 reminds us, lament, mourn, and weep to a prideful church that he's talking to in Jerusalem. Lament, mourn, and weep. Let your, let your, your gladness be turned to mourning. Humble yourself, in verse 10, in, in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. It says before that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I think as we come to the Lord and we confess our sins, we ought to do it not just to, hey, you know, God, I messed up, but you're good. So see ya, you know, that's not the heart. That's a very prideful spirit. But when we come to the Lord in confession, we really need to take a time and just say, God, I don't deserve this, but I know I can come. And understand the weight of the sin, because you you feel it. You and I, we feel the weight of sin. But know that the Lord is quick to take it, because as we confess, if we confess, we don't just mourn. We confess our sins, what it says in 1 John 5. He's faithful. He's just to forgive us our sins. Right? Sorry, sorry, 1 John 1, 9. I think that got changed up there. 1 John 1, 9. He, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. We know that promise. And we should hold tight to that promise. So in rebuilding the soul, we first must assess, even though it might be tough, we must assess where we're at, you and I today. We must be quick to confess, and I get this, and I see this, but we also need to do these things so we can be blessed. As it says in, 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 in verse 4, and it ends this chapter, so it was when I heard these words back in verse 4, it says, I sat and I wept, and I mourned with many days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Let's look further on in verse 8. Remember, I pray, this is in his prayer, Nehemiah's prayer. I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations, which he did. God's faithful to his promise, okay? But if he's faithful to do that, but remember he says this, if you return to me and keep my commandments and then do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants, your people, 
whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servants and to the prayers of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servants prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. We'll get to the cupbearer part in a moment. But I want you to see, he's praying scripture, folks. He's praying a promise from, from um, I think it's uh, um, Exodus chapter 4. God spoke to the people. If you are uh, going to be disobedient, I'll scatter you. But if you return to me, I'll bring you back. A beautiful promise that, that because Nehemiah knew the word, and because he had this time and he prayed the word, He could be blessed in this confession time that he had. In rebuilding the soul, we must pray and speak scripture so that we can be sure of God's promises and reinforce our defenses from the attack of the enemy. This is as important as, you know what, the enemy wants to remind you and tell you, or say to you, tell you, tell you again and again, you know what, God is not going to forgive you for that. You messed up too big. You can't be saved. You can't be forgiven. You've blown it. Well, I'm going to say right back and, and with my knees you know, to the ground, Lord, you know what? I know you say, you, if I confess my sins, you will be faithful and you will be just to forgive. And not just forgive, but you'll cleanse me. You'll give me a new heart and a new mind today. I can, I can walk in victory today, even though I've blown it. God's promises. If you know Scripture, just like Nehemiah, he remembered. I remember the promises of the Lord. I'm going to take it to the throne room and say, God, you are faithful. You were faithful to scatter us, but you're going to be faithful again to bring us back. So I would challenge you. How much of this are you in? Uh, you'll, you'll see just some extra bonuses. There's some tools that you can, you can as you listen and study God's Word, it'll be remembered. I think as often as you are in this, and sometimes you might hear a lesson or a study, you're like, Jim, you know what? I, 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 I had a good confession time. I'm really not, there's not a lot of sin in my life right now. I, I think I'm really tight with the Lord. That's great, but listen up, because there's going to be a day where you're going to need this message. And, and the great thing is, is, there's a promise in John 14:26 where the promise of the Spirit was given, and Jesus said, He will bring into remembrance everything I taught you. That's an amazing promise because I can't remember, you know, 30 minutes and I feel bad for most of you guys because I go 40. But what you're hearing and what you're reading on a daily basis, you might be like, I don't remember. I I had a great I had a great time this morning, but I don't remember it all. That's okay because the spirit is able to take what you put in your thinker. He's able to take what you, you heard or you listen and he's able to bring it into remembrance. The work of the Spirit. It's not as though when, when, in all of the discourse, when Jesus is telling his disciples, "Don't even think about what you're going to say," and and when you go before those rulers and people and stuff, that I'll bring to remembrance what you're going to say, or I'll let you know what you're going to say. He's not saying there that don't study anything. He's not saying don't, you know, you don't have to go to church or listen to anything. You know, the Holy Spirit's in you. It's all good. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying as you study. Don't think that you've got to put it all together in some great thing or remember it all when you you know, read it one day. Because what you put in, all be faithful to, to bring about. That's the work of the Spirit. That's an amazing thing. It's an amazing promise. But it challenges you and me. And even when I'm reading the Bible and my daily devotionals feel kind of dry, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Why did I need to read that today? Well, maybe it didn't make sense for today, but God's seen something that you need for the future. And and getting it in your life and in your mind today is going to help you out in the future. It's going to be big. It's going to be important, I believe. So maybe when we're talking about these things and we really realize that Scripture and prayer and Scripture in my life is so key in rebuilding the soul, don't neglect this. Even when it feels dry, don't neglect this. Don't neglect your time with the Lord. Give it all you got. Take it in. Take notes when you get a chance. Know that whenever you apply yourself to what's going on here in your study, God can use it. He can bring it back to remembrance when it's time to be brought out of captivity. It's time. This is the time for the scripture. 
I can just imagine it, it, Nehemiah is like, I don't know why I'm reading about this, you know, but you know, this is the time. I need to pray this scripture. This is the time. So that's one of the bonuses. I think the other thing I want you to check out is 1 Corinthians 11, 23. I, I missed the 11, but that's in the notes. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 32. Uh, check that out on your own time. I would challenge you, if you want to take some homework time, because I know we're running out of time here today. If you want to take some time, I would check that out. That's an interesting scripture. Like I said, he, he, he goes and, and Paul mentions to the church that at Corinth that some of them have fallen asleep literally because they were taking the table, God's table, in an unworthy manner. And in fact, it later on says at the end of that chapter, it says that if they would have dealt with their sin or confessed it, that they would have avoided that. You're saying that me simply confessing my sin before the Lord, in, 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 a, in a right heart, again, not just whatever, but me confess, or them doing that could have actually saved some of their lives? That's what Paul's saying. I'm not going to say anything short of that. Simply put, if I would have confessed my sin and had myself in a right relationship with the Lord, that that, that stuff wouldn't have befell me, that illness wouldn't have happened? I know some prosperity gospel preachers take that really far and they say, well, you can't be sick, and if you are, you know, there's sin involved. No, that's not it. But in a real, in a real sense, Paul was saying to the church that there are some of you, and that's how he put it, there are some of you that are sick. And it's more than just spiritual. It's actually physical, but it's because your spiritual life's not in order. Sobering stuff. But we know that we can come to the table. That's the great thing. If we see that in 1 Corinthians, that promise at the end there, if we would confess, if we simply confess, Lord, I I, I busted, I got it, I know, I'm wrong. And I need I need to change. I know, Lord, I'm I, I'm I'm honest before you. I, I need this. That God can reorganize things in our lives. His spirit can rebuild the walls. He he can start putting our lives back together again. Don't think that you have to take communion here once a month only. Know that you can whip out a loaf of bread and some grape juice or something. The idea is the table, coming to the table, saying, Lord, I've blown it. But I want to get back right on the right track with you today. That's how we want to end today. I, I, you guys go ahead and come up and we're going to close. Lord, let's, let's just pray. Put, let, kind of put our hearts in an attitude of prayer right now. Lord, this is a tough message. Lord, it's tough to assess what's going on in our lives sometimes because we're going so fast. But Lord, how key and how important and how good it is to take a moment and stop. And and Lord, just say, be real. Be real with us. We don't don't want any wicked way, anything to come against what you want to do in our lives. We, We don't want anything in our lives, Lord, to give you a bad rap or a bad name or... So, Lord, would you speak to our hearts today? Be that messenger to tell us what the reality is in the assessment of of our situation. Lord, Spirit, speak to our hearts right now. Lord, as we we come, would would you convict us of sin so that we could confess that? Lord, knowing you're faithful and just to forgive us. Lord, would would Scripture even come to mind as we come into Your presence right now, Lord, of Your promises? If we do sin, we have an advocate, which is Jesus. We we, we know we're forgiven through Him. And Lord, as we confess these things, Lord, that gets us in right relationship with You. Lord, would there not be anything here today in in anyone's life here that would cause them in an unworthy manner to, to continue on living with You? living for you. Lord, as we sing, Lord, would we just flush out our lives with your cleansing power and be quick to deal with sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's close this time. This in that same attitude. 
Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's close this time just in that same attitude. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's close this time just in that same attitude.